we we start this this session. Uh, this is uh, one of the many many sessions we have uh, between these two hours in this in this uh, conference. I, I counted up to twenty sessions, so probably. Um, we will have um, attendance, but not so many because there are many, many parallel sessions at the same time. Um, we have four papers, and uh, we will follow the order of the of the program. And uh, we start uh, with the first paper by Michelle Zimmerman, and uh, we give each paper twenty minutes um, with five minutes uh, for questions, remarks. Uh, the papers are really related. Some of them, uh, these two, two, two are really related, uh, and, and I also hope that we can um, start a dialogue or, or a conversation between between the participants, uh, the, the presenters, actually in this in this session. But of course, uh, the public will have access as well to 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 this to this time. So, uh, Michel, uh, the floor is yours. So, so 20 minutes, please. Yes, cool. Let me just set this up. Um, you should see my slides now, right? And yes, thank um, you. Cool. So, well, thanks for the introduction and um, welcome to my presentation on um, industrial rebound effects in Switzerland which is a joint work by Frank Föhringer, Philipp Talman, Vaso Moro, and myself. Um, but let's first address what um, rebound effects actually are. So in, in theory, an energy efficiency improvement would decrease the energy use by whoever is receiving the energy efficiency improvement, may that be households or firms. But at the same time, an energy efficient improvement reduces the effective price of an energy service because it allows to produce the same amount of goods or services um, with less energy. And that then could incentivize firms um, to substitute other production factors such as labor and capital or materials for energy, which then in turn increases um, energy use again. At the same time, there is also um, the, if the income effect, which comes from the fact that the lower effective price of energy services reduces uh, production costs, which could then incentivize more production and increase um, energy use again. And these two effects are a major component of the so-called rebound effect at the microeconomic level. Rebound effects could also manifest at a higher level of aggregation, for example, at the meso and the macroeconomic level. And in total, then you can calculate a rebound effect by comparing actual energy savings with the potential energy savings that you anticipated from the energy efficiency improvement in itself. Why should that matter for Switzerland? <clears throat> well, Switzerland already has a pretty low energy intensity compared to the European wide average both nationally and in production. But as you can see on the right-hand side here, um, this shows the final energy consumption per person and year with um, 2,000 at 100% and where we want to go by 2035. So we still need quite substantial um, reductions in energy use. And for this, energy efficiency plays a big role. But if given the low energy intensity and, and the high importance of energy efficiency, if significant rebound effects were found as a result of these energy efficiency improvements to offset many energy savings, these targets would then be in serious jeopardy. And in addition, Switzerland also has um, a high dependence on fossil fuel imports from abroad, making it even more important to have effective energy efficiency improvements. How do we do? How did we do this? Well, we developed a new recursively dynamic computable general equilibrium model, which um, runs from 2020 till 2050, with myopic um, actors, utility maximizing households, and profit maximizing firms. We used input output data for Switzerland, and we made a rather simplified aggregation where we have four non energy good sectors the energy intensive manufacturing sector, rest of industry, transport sector, and services sector. We 
chose this aggregation simply to have a to be, we, drew, we drew a line ac uh, along the reliance on energy and therefore if you have an energy intensive sector for the primary and secondary sector and the non energy and the less energy intensive sector and the same for the tertiary sector moreover we have three energy supply sectors a refined oil natural gas and electricity sector we as is customary in um, cge models we use nested constant elasticity of substitution functions which you can see and nesting trees which you can see on the right hand side here and we also because switzerland essentially is a small open economy we use a small open economy assumption where price changes in switzerland won't affect world prices in the rebound literature there is a big emphasis on the relationship between capital and energy and therefore we put uh, we we took a novel approach and how we relate these two in our model and um, by disaggregating the capital stock into two types of capital and the at different nests so first we have an we have energy system capital the cap the energy system capital is the capital that is used to turn energy into usable energy that could be for example an internal combustion engine of a truck or a kiln in a cement factory and for this capital we assume weak substitutability to energy we um, assumed this to be roughly 10 percent of the total capital stock which we think is appropriate given that the majority of capital in switzerland is used in structures and machines and equipment and so forth um yeah as i've said you know the non-energy capital simply is the remaining capital stock so um staying with the example i just gave that would be the truck itself or the factory that the kiln is located in and this is complementary to energy service meaning that it's independent of any changes in the, the effective price of energy and that is the, the, the remaining 90 percent and we believe that this provides a more sophisticated representation of the relationship between energy and capital to for the determination of rebound effects in an economy. We model energy efficiency um, as energy augmenting technological change. And this occurs, this energy efficiency improvement occurs each year. Um, we assume a 2.2% per year increase in our main scenario in production, which nominally would then give a roughly 48 percent reduction in the industry-wide energy use because we wanted to focus really on, on on industrial rebound effects and we assume no energy efficiency improvement in household effects and in households meaning that the corresponding line for the whole domestic energy use is correspondingly higher or smaller we then compare this scenario with a steady state reference scenario, and we also undertook some sensitivity analysis to better gauge um, how our novel approach between capital and the, regarding the relationship between energy and capital influences the results. So let's talk about the results. Um, this graph shows um, the rebound effect in uh, 2021 so after the introduction of the first energy efficiency improvement and in 2050 the turquoise bars here which uh, is in the in the last period in 2050 and how to read this is essentially that for example this rest of industry sector in 2021 had a 20 percent rebound effect which means that the energy efficiency improvement was only 80 percent effective um yes and as you can see um, in the non-energy um, sectors it is evident that there are quite substantial rebound effects but that they also vary quite strongly for the more energy intensive sectors such as the energy intensive manufacturing industry and the transport sector we have relatively high rebound effects and for the rest of industry um, less so and interestingly, for the services sector, which isn't that energy intensive at all, we still find rather significant rebound effects, which is because it's comparatively capital intensive. So not only it, it 
it doesn't really it do, does not only matter how energy intensive a sector is but also how important capital is in its production mix for the um fossil fuel and the electricity sectors it looks a bit different the um the fossil fuel sectors actually use less energy uh, or save even more energy than anticipated with the energy efficiency improvement which is mainly just because there is a drastic drop in demand because everyone uh, like the energy use energy demand by each sector decreases quite uh, quite strongly and therefore their production contracts for electricity the the picture is a bit more mixed because it also sees that drop in demand for its products but it also has a relatively high um capital share input and therefore it rough yeah it's uh, energy efficiency is basically almost 100% effective at an aggregate level this um you have roughly a 35% on average rebound effect for industry and a little bit higher at the domestic level energy efficiency obviously also has a or is ha has a potentially positive impact on the economy because it, it the economy becomes more efficient and that also shows in the results and this shows this table shows the change relative to the ref to the steady state scenario in 2050 and as you can see the impact is positive but marginal particularly compared to the scale of energy efficiency improvement that take place so gdp grows by roughly 1.7 percent which is mainly driven by private consumption you also see how energy use changes uh, you can see that the household increases its energy use because of um, these income effects and industrial and domestic energy use actually decreases but it's much less than would have been without the rebound effects we just discovered <clears throat> focusing on the the relationship between energy and capital we undertook three sensitivity analyses one is uh, we doubled the elasticity of substitution between the energy composite and energy system capital we did this simply because in the literature it's um, very often emphasized that this is a crucial um, elasticity we also doubled the share of energy system capital in total capital to check how our assumption of 10 percent energy system capital influenced the results and we removed our assumption of complementarity between energy service and non-energy capital by replacing it with um, weak substitutability as we have um, at the lower nest with energy system capital and, and the energy composite so how does this impact our results um, here you see the rebound effects at the industry-wide level and the domestic level for 2050 and at the top here just as a reminder is the um, impact for our main scenario and you can quickly see that doubling the elasticity of substitution between the energy composite and the and energy system capital quite strongly influences the results because it allows um, firms or, or production to more readily uh, react to the change in the effective energy price and substitute capital energy system capital for energy more easily this effect is much stronger than when we double the share of the energy system capital in the total capital stock uh, showing that it's actually that yeah that the that the choice of the elasticity of substitution is way more crucial than how large um, the share of the energy system capital actually is and most interestingly um, when we remove the complementary assumption complementarity assumption between energy services and the non-energy capital and um, we see that this is has a strong impact so i mean domestic rebound effects grow to over 50 percent and industry-wide rebound effects grow to more than 45 percent and coincidentally this is also this it, the same result as if we had not differentiated our capital stock at all not differentiate or, ha or having a homogeneous capital stock uh, rather than the 
the two-part capital stock that that, that we um, applied is actually how it is traditionally done in rebound assessments. And this result actually is a it's quite interesting because it hints at a fact that traditional rebound assessment may very well overestimate the importance of rebound effects and underestimate the effectiveness of energy efficiency improvements when, when, when assessing rebound effects. So what are the main insights from, from the simulations I just showed you? Well, firstly, um, the capital intensity of a sector is almost as big a determinant of rebound effects as energy intensity, as we've seen with um, the services sector uh, demonstrating quite strong rebound effect, rebound effects as a consequence of the energy efficiency improvement. Then, oh, then as I've just mentioned, the traditional rebound assessments with only a homogeneous capital stock and thus a less sophisticated modeling of capital may essentially overestimate rebound effects. Then the response to the energy efficiency improvement varies greatly between the sectors. So as already mentioned, the energy efficiency, uh, energy intensity is an important determinant and it, the capital intensity, but also particularly for, uh, we found for the case of Switzerland, an, another important factor is how trade dependent a sector is. So how important um, exports and imports are for, for the relevant sectors. This all suggests that, um, that you can't just take a broad brush with your energy efficiency measures, but rather need a more sector specific approach when devising energy efficiency improvements or energy efficiency policies. And um, what we also found is that the more efficient an economy already is, the less likely large rebound effects become. Uh, we've seen that in the decreasing trend um, for, um, for our uh, rebound effects over time. So, so for, for all non-energy uh, non supply sectors, non-energy sectors, rebound effects decreased over time. And we also saw that when we tried a higher energy efficiency improvement than the 2.2%, the, the effect in the first year is comparatively uh, small compared to, to our main scenario, but then it decreases even stronger, which hints at a decreasing marginal benefit of each energy efficiency improvement and thus a smaller rebound effect in the long term. To conclude, um, Industrial energy efficiency improvements in Switzerland are only partially effective in reducing final energy use. It, this means that rebound assessments really need to be routine, uh, routinely included in the policymaking process, as otherwise the national energy reduction targets will be missed. And given the urgency, this could be quite detrimental. And, and, that be, and again, because I mean, as we all know, we really need to reduce our um, our energy use, particularly from fossil fuels. We should also see that um, see to that rebound effects are closer to zero, and thus um, the impact of energy of energy policies and how they can counteract rebound effects should also be investigated more regularly. Um, I'll I'm currently working on a decomposition analysis to um, help understand these effects um, better. And this seeks to shed light on the individual drivers of rebound effects to really have a better, also have a better understanding on where to pull which lever to offset or to increase the efficiency at uh, the effectiveness of energy efficiency to, yeah, to, as, to as high as possible. Yes, that's uh, some references here. Um, thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions and remarks. Okay, thanks, uh, Michelle. Um, you were perfectly on time, uh, 20 minutes. So uh, now um, it's time for questions, comments. Uh, so remember that you can use your, your hand or you can also 
um, send a question in the chat. I don't know whether there is any. We don't have a lot of people here, as I advanced you before. Only, I think, uh, around six people apart from us. Um, the, the presenters and myself and, 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 and Diego. So, um, any question from anyone? If not, uh, Michelle, um, I would like to, of course, you, you know, uh, you, you were uh, not dealing directly with this issue and, and you were um, pointing out at the end of the, of the presentation that this was uh, an important question to, to be raised by, by further research and that you were already um, doing some stuff there. But I wonder what would be the best um, option uh, for a policymakers for a policymaker if um, if uh, they want to to deal with this issue um, perhaps uh, you know trying to to to, to introduce uh, energy taxes to mm -hmm. to reduce the you know further the the the, the use of, uh, of of this um, you know energy energy related um, um, activities or more information, probably. I mean, it, it's very interesting your your paper because, uh, you know, as far as I know, um, a lot of the literature on, on this was uh, on, on residential uh, issues. So, so mm -hmm. this exploration is is, is probably well, um, you know, very well received. So, so mm -hmm. what would be your your opinion on, on the best options to, yeah. to deal with? I mean, essentially, what needs to happen is, I mean, as I've said, you know, the rebound effects occur because the effective price of the energy service becomes cheaper. You know, you 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 can use energy more cheaply, and the best way, I guess, would simply to offset that price differential, right? Um, by by introducing a, as you've mentioned, an energy tax, a CO two tax, a cap and trade cap and trade um, scheme and the literature actually, and that is also what I want to include in, in, in my next paper is that, you know, I here I assume costless energy efficiency improvement, you know, they, they just, the energy efficiency improvement comes mana from heaven. And some literature has shown that if you, in, if you introduce costly energy efficiency improvement that actually reduces uh, rebound effects quite drastically. And therefore, the best way would really be to to set a energy tax to to yeah to offset that price differential and to exactly prevent the the, the effective price of the energy service becoming cheaper. The problem there is, and that at the end of the day, you know, I mean, rebound effects from a welfare or from a macroeconomic point of view are nothing nothing terrible. You know, I mean, it's 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 essentially what what drives the economy forward, substitution effects and, and, and reallocating um, production factors the most effectively. But given the, the urgency of reducing energy use, you then have to consider what are the welfare impacts of, of, of an energy tax on, on which actors, what is, you know, is it socially equitable or I don't know. Um, and so, yeah, to long story short, I guess it, 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 it would have to be a policy so like a tax who makes energy more expensive. Yeah, of course, but this, this raises the issue of competitiveness, right? Because you, mm. are, you are dealing with the industry and, and, mm. and we are seeing that this is a difficult issue already in the EU with, uh, with you know, the emissions trading and, and mm. other, uh, other pieces we have in place. But anyway, thanks a lot. I don't know whether there is anyone who wants to, I mean, we have one minute if I don't see any hand or or any question in the in the chat. Okay, uh, Michelle, thanks a lot. I think it was a very clear, uh, very clear presentation. Very, very well done. And uh, Michelle from, you. From, from the Col Polytechnic Federal de, from, from Losa. Thanks a lot, and we go for the with the second presentation by Shivani Taneja from Surrey, the University yes. of Surrey. So, hello, uh, hello. Shivani. and um, you know that we you have twenty minutes and, and roughly five minutes then for questions and, and comments from the from the audience. 
So I will be um, presenting my paper on estimating the historical impacts of information and communication technologies on industrial energy demand. Uh, information and communication technologies have complex implications for energy demand. On the one hand, ICTs can offer many benefits, uh, such as being energy efficient, and therefore they can facilitate a reduction in energy use. However, on the other hand, energy efficiency can result in a rise in energy demand. Therefore, the net effects of ICT is not clear. Our research investigates into the overall impacts and addresses the following question. Is ICT net energy saving? So the approach we use is that we estimate the energy cost share equation, which is based on a transload cost function. Uh, we also derive the elasticity of energy consumption with respect to ICT capital services in order to measure the magnitude of the effect. And we show whether ICTs are related to an increase or decrease in overall energy use. So previous literature has analyzed the impacts of ICTs on energy demand. However, our study benefits from using an extensive data set covering more countries and sectors. We have 28 sectors, 17 countries, and 13 years. We also add renewable energy to the energy quantity data. Uh, our results are consistent across several samples and they are robust to different specifications that provide additional confidence in our research outputs. So we construct our data set from four data sources. We use the EU CLAMS, uh, which provides estimates of inputs like capital, labor, uh, it has value added and other measures. We also take data from the World Input Output Database. This has data on disaggregated energy use by industrial sector and field type. The IEA database, uh, the Energy Prices and Taxes database, uh, uh, we collect the industrial energy prices for each country. And we also take data from the OECD data set uh, so that we can transform the nominal values to real values and a common currency. So we take the purchasing power uh, parity data uh, from the OECD data set. So our estimating sample has 17 OECD countries. Uh, it has 28 industrial sectors, but we drop two sectors, uh, electricity, gas, and water, and coal, refined petroleum, and nuclear fuel, because these are different in their production structures. And our sample covers the period of 1995 to 2007, and our total number of observation is more than 5,000. So we estimate the share of energy in variable cost. This equation forms the basis of our econometric model. Uh, it is, the energy cost share is a function of relative prices, which is PE over PL, uh, ICT capital services, non-ICT capital services, output and time. And then we calculate the total average elasticity with respect to ICT using the formula. Uh, so it is a coefficient of the ICT, which we get from the regression, uh, and um, energy cost share minus uh, rental price of capital. So these are our results uh, for all sectors. When we use the OLS regression techniques, we have four models. Uh, the first model includes all the covariates of interest. Uh, the second model includes the covariates of interest and the country and dummy, uh, sorry, country dummy variables and sector dummy variables. Uh, model three uh, includes the time trend uh, and model four um, includes the year dummy variables, but not the time trend, of course. And we can see that the ICT variable is significant for model one and model two. Therefore, we calculate the average elasticity of energy demand with respect to ICT, and we have a value of uh, minus 0.1937 for model one and minus 0.077. Uh, so using OLS regression techniques, these results show that ICTs do not have a large effect on energy savings across all countries and sectors taken together. Uh, we now split the sample 
uh, by sector. So we have the manufacturing sector, the services and other sectors. The other sectors include agricultural, forestry, hunting, mining, construction, transport and storage. And we find that ICT variable is significant for manufacturing, for services and other sectors. And when we calculate the average elasticity of energy demand with respect to ICT, we have a value of minus 0.0149 for manufacturing. And for services, we have minus 0.3509, whereas for other sectors, it is 0.0337. So splitting the sample by sectors and using the OLS regression techniques, the results show that there is evidence of energy savings within services. The average elasticity of energy demand with respect to ICT is very small within manufacturing. And other sectors sh uh, show a positive average elasticity with respect to ICT. We also uh, conduct some robustness checks uh, by excluding post-communist countries, uh, such as Czech Republic and Hungary, as both joined the EU in 2004. Uh, in the second model, we exclude country with, countries with missing data. So our sample had some missing data for uh, Australia, Belgium, and Sweden. And uh, we excluded those countries in the second model. And in the third model, we excluded all the countries, uh, the post-communists and the countries with missing data. Uh, and we found that ICT uh, is not significant. So these results are consistent with the main results and show that ICTs do not have a significant effect after including dummy variables for countries, sectors, and years. So the conclusion is that after applying the OLS uh, regression technique to a cross-country, cross-sector panel data set, we find that investments in ICTs have a modest reduction in energy demand across all sectors and countries taken together. The effect of ICTs increasing energy efficiency may be offset by greater use of ICTs themselves. We find evidence of energy saving in the service sector, as we found that the average elasticity with respect to ICT for services uh, was minus 0.35 and minus 0.01 for manufacturing, whereas it is 0.03 for other sectors. And robustness checks confirm that ICTs have a modest impact on energy savings with additional confidence, um, which provides additional confidence to our results as we use different samples. So the policy relevances that our findings show, uh, show the role that ICTs play in reducing energy use and are important in achieving the government targets of net zero emissions by 2050. These results oppose the claim that ICTs are contributing to a green industrial revolution and the effect of ICTs increasing uh, energy efficiency may be offset by greater use of ICTs themselves. Our future research can possibly collect a more up-to-date data and draw a comparison with our results. Um, thank you. Okay, uh, Shivani, thanks, uh, thanks very much. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, let's see, uh, you were right. I mean, actually, uh, uh, it didn't take a lot of time. <laughs> your presentation. Um, and and uh, so we have time for, for questions and, and yes. comments from, from the public. Uh, so anyone? Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, uh, Paco. Hello, hello, Hello. Javier. hello. Como va? Bien. <laughs> Todo bien. <laughs> One, one sim, uh, simple question. I like very much this uh, issue, but uh, maybe uh, have you, could you make a robustness checks maybe using panel data model considering, considering heterogeneity and some more sophisticated, sophisticated panel data models? I don't know because the results are very interesting, but maybe could you, you make this exercise to to pu publish this uh, this uh, paper or something like that, I seen that uh, if I were a reviewer, I could ask for that. What, what, have you made a robustness check of different models to to compare and to 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 could say, uh, say that uh, is true? This uh, this uh, consequence, this result, that there is no very important uh, effect. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, I did conduct the robustness checks. The results are here, uh, which are I excluded the post-communist countries, 
and excluded countries with missing data and excluding uh, both post-communist and countries with missing data. And I find that the ICT variable is not significant over here, which is similar to our main results where if I include the year dummy variables, country dummy variables, and sector dummy variables, uh, I find that uh, the ICT variable is not significant. And similarly, if I go back go here to the robust check. You, you, have, you have used uh, all the time, I, I, I can see, OLS techniques. Yes. I don't know if you have used the, maybe the similar related regressions. It's very old, but maybe, I don't know, uh, panel data models that are more sophisticated. Uh, I don't know exactly what, but uh, I don't know what you're seeing, Xavier, but maybe could uh, improve this work uh, using another more sophisticated econometric techniques? Certainly, I, I, I think the paper is, 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 uh, is interesting. It's uh, approaching an issue which is a uh, which is important, as, as she and Givana said, and um, and we don't have a lot of uh, of, of evidence. Um, uh, Shivana, what what would be your advice then? Uh, I mean, you were talk, talking about um, about uh, policy implications as as before with Michelle. I mean, we go, we could also see some kind of rebound. I mean, not exactly rebound, but you know, a kind of a, a, an increase of. Of, of, of energy uh, due to this, uh, to this uh, ICT, um, as you mentioned in your conclusion. So, so what would you be your advice? Uh, I mean, it seems that your message is, is not uh, too optimistic, right? I mean, that this is not going to be the green revolution that many are awaiting and that uh, perhaps we need to, to look for alternatives and even uh, act on this, on this, uh, on, on, on this ICT. Uh, yes, uh, yes, I, I think that ICTs are not really contributing to the green industrial revolution. And uh, well, also, we have to keep in mind that our data set that we are using is from 1995 to 2007. Uh, and this is because there isn't any data uh, which was available. So because it is, uh, um, I mean, an updated data set could also confirm whether uh, it's true, uh, but as of now, with these results, we can see that ICTs are just contributing to a modest reduction in energy demand, uh, which can be important in achieving the government targets of net zero emissions. So, uh, and in terms of other econometric techniques, uh, the one thing uh, that um, is possibly uh, something that we have tried is uh, looking at quantile regressions. Uh, so, uh, and we get similar results as well. So uh, the quantile regression is also um, proving that ICTs are uh, not contributing much to the energy savings. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have Yes. Yeah, I have so, some questions. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Jana Axenberg, I'm presenting after you. And I basically did the same analysis, just with microeconomic and more recent data, but yeah. only on the manufacturing sector. So I am pretty familiar with this model. So I have some questions. If you, so you basically have, your data is just larger than mm -hmm. the data from Schulte et al, but all observations which are there are mm -hmm. in the are also in the short estimation, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So if you just estimate your model with your data, do you get the same and just use the observations which are included in the shorter estimation? Do you have the same results? Uh, no, because our data is not similar. Uh, the difference is that we also add the uh, renewable energy to the energy quantity data. Right. And also, uh, because we we do this part, uh, it makes the model slightly different. Because so, it, and could you just exclude the renewable energy data? Like, could you first replicate the, the, exact, the exact results and then start from there? 
So would this be possible or? Uh, yes, of course. Okay. Of course, yes. Okay. And uh, then I was wondering why um, Paco already said it, but he was not, um, you're not using first differences. So they're using first differences. Yes. Right? Uh, that is also uh, another major difference. So instead, um, to account for fixed effects, we are in a way taking the dummy variables. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah mm -hmm. They're doing, they're doing both. I think it's a yeah. So they uh, kind of double it, but it, yeah, I think it does not affect the results that much. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and I'm also interesting if you go to the sector, um, to the manufacturing sector versus service sector slide. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, yeah, I'm wondering what. Ah, okay, no, okay, now I see. It. I was just. Yeah, I think it's really interesting that you get a positive coefficient for the manufacturing sector, mm -hmm. um, because I will um, get a different result, but I will present <laughs> it later. <laughs> so now. So, yeah. so thank you very much. Thank you. Well, as I said before, we have two papers which, which are really related and uh, if we don't have more questions um, from the public, from the other participants, I don't see any hand or in the chat. So we'll go to, to Jana. Yes. For her presentation. Jana from CEW, Germany. Yes, exactly. So, um... So do you see my screen well and hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm presenting climate protection of protection potentials of digitalized production processes, microeconometric evidence. This research is part of the project Pleditrans, which is funded by the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research, and it is joint work with Thomas Niebel, who is a colleague of mine at the Center for European Economic Research, the ZEW, which is an institute based in Mannheim, Germany, and we both work at the Digital Economy Department. So what's our motivation? So currently we're witnessing two parallel trends as already stated. So we have to cut down carbon emissions tremendously to limit global warming. And therefore the European Union aims to improve energy efficiency or energy intensity substantially. So the amount of energy used to generate one unit of output. However, we see in recent year, years that energy intensity improvements are actually declining in the European industry. For instance, in 2014, improvements were at 3.6%. However, in 2017, improvements were at 1.8% roughly. However, you have to consider that before this period, improvements were more volatile. Nonetheless, this figure suggests a need for action. On the other side, we have an ongoing digital transformation within enterprises. So this means that artificial intelligence, big data, or just simple laptops or computers are used more frequently. So the left, no, the right figure shows the share of European manufacturing firms which are providing portable devices. So laptops, tablets, or mobile phones to more than 20% of their employees. And you see a strong increase. So you have the digital transformation, and then you have a strong need for energy efficiency improvements at the firm level. So we were wondering how do they relate to each other? And, um, and the common view by, positive, uh, by, policy, by policy makers is that there's a positive relationship. So that there are large synergies between energy intensity improvements and um, digital technologies. And the narrative here is that ICT improves the quantity and quality of information. For example, you have smart manufacturing and this increases overall efficiency and also energy efficiency. And it is assumed that savings from the use of digital technologies are larger than the energy they use by themselves. And there's already literature on this so they all are sector level studies. So studies which are using aggregated data and they find a positive link between ICT usage and electric as well as overall energy efficiency improvements. 
as well as a decrease in carbon emissions. And uh, previous results tend to be pretty strong. For instance, Schulte et al, they find that a 1% increase in ICT capital decreases energy intensity by 0.235%. And they also observe that ICT grows at 12% per year. So considering such a large growth, growth the, this elasticity should have an economic impact on actual in decreases in energy intensity. However, as I said, all these studies are using sector level data, so aggregated level data, and this has some drawbacks. So for instance, aggregated data does not allow to observe dynamics within industry. So you do not know whether a variable is changing because um, some firms are disappearing and new ones are, are appearing, or whether there's an actual change within a firm. Also, you cannot analyze firm level heterogeneity, so differences between firms. And last but not least, you have to make different assumptions about, or you have to make assumptions about different establishments and depending on the assumptions, your results might vary. So we are wondering, can findings be confirmed at the firm level and do differences between firms exist? So for our, for our analysis, we use AFID, which stands for Amtliche Firmdaten für Deutschland. It's data from 2009 till 2017, and it's unbalanced firm level data from the German statistical offices only on manufacturing firms. So for those firms, reporting is obligatory. The data is thoroughly checked, hence the data quality is quite high. Um, in my sample, there are approximately 13,800 firms per year. So quite a lot, and I use variables such as energy use and cost software investments to approximate the firm level degree of digitalization, as well as control variables on labor use and costs, tangible investments, as well as firm level output. And we also complement our data with cross value added deflators from Eurostat, for instance, as well as EU CLAMPS data to sufficiently calculate a firm level capital star. So um, before I show you the empirical strategy, I want to talk a bit about um, our proxy for the firm level degree of digitalization. So we use software investments to calculate a software capital stock by means of the perpetual inventory method. So the capital from the pre um, pre period before is depreciated and current investments are added. So that's how we calculate the capital stock. And as I said, we only use software capital. So hardware capital is missing. So is this sufficient? Um, first, it is missing because there isn't any information on it in the data. So we can only use software capital. Um, but we have a small subsample for which we have more detailed information on ICT usage. These are approximately 16,000 observations between 2012 and 2017. And on the left figure, you see software capital intensity, so the amount of software used to generate one unit of output by firms that do provide and do not provide portable devices to 20% of the employees. The gray bar are the firms which do not provide, and the pink bar are those firms which do provide, and you see they have on average a much larger software capital intensity. The same applies to the maximum data transmission rate, so the internet speed. And this is the right figure, and the very right bar shows firms which have 100 Mbits or more, so they have high speed, and the very left bar are firms which have two Mbits or less. And you see the higher the internet speed, the higher the, soft, the average software capital intensity. So software capital relates to other digital technologies and we consider it as a sufficient proxy. Nonetheless, we face one issue that you always face if you um, use intangible investments. They're heavily skewed, they're lumpy, and we observe 20% of firms without any software investments. Um, so we have to impute them by an obligatory euro, and this is an issue which um, I refer later. But um, 
now I show you our empirical strategy. So um, I think the slide looks familiar. It's pretty similar to the presentation before. So to have um, results that are comparable to the sector level, we also apply the approach from Schulte et al. Um, they use a translog cost function, which is based on the seminal work of Christensen et al, for instance, as well as Brown and Christensen. And in Schulte's et al, at its approach, for different forms of capital are considered as quasi-fixed factors and materials are excluded as they're considered as weakly separable. Applying Shepard's lemma allows estimating the following equation where the share of energy costs and variable costs depends on the energy price relative to the labor price, software or ICT capital intensity, tangible capital intensity output, as well as disembodied technological change captured by time dummies. The demand ele elasticity for energy, which is also the elasticity for energy intensity, as it is controlled for output, can be calculated by dividing, dividing the coefficient of ICT by the share of energy costs and variable costs to get the percentage change in variable costs. And by taking account, so here subtracting, the change of variable costs induced by ICT, which is approximated by the cost for ICT divided by variable costs. So that's the empirical strategy. And here are the results. So in the first column, you see the estimation or the model estimated as presented. So I estimate in first differences as Schulte had I estimated in first differences. And the coefficient of ICT is negative and highly significant. The elasticity is so a 1% per increase in ICT relates to a decrease in 0.007% in energy intensity, which is pretty small. So Schulte et al. had 0.2%. So at the film level, the elasticity is much smaller. So why is this, this so small? Is there, for example, is there something wrong with my capital stocks? As I said, I observe a lot of firms which do not invest in all, or investments are lumpy. So firms do not invest, and they, then they start to invest. So I observe a plausibly large percentage increase in relative software capital. So I exclude all these investments and re-estimate the model again. Then it's not highly significant anymore, but it's still significant and the coefficient is a bit larger. But if you look at the elasticity, it's still pretty small. So this does not affect the qualitative interpretation of the result. So another issue could be that I wrongly estimated initial capital stocks. So applying the PIM, I have to estimate an initial capital stocks. And this could cause issues. So I exclude the first three years and re-estimate the model again. And it's pretty similar to the first column. So this does not seem to cause an issue. Also, what could be a problem is a misleading correlation. So I use capital stocks, and if firms are not investing, the capital stocks are automatically decreasing, and maybe any relative energy use is increasing, so that would cause a correlation and would be misleading. So I only just consider active investments. So when the software capital stock goes up, so this is column four, and, and the coefficient is a bit smaller, but still in the same range at, as in column one. So the correlation comes from active investments. Um, I want to show you one example where I do observe um, a bit larger effects. This is when I estimate in levels and just use the use a pool or S estimator. And then the coefficient is four times larger than in column one, which indicates that effects between firms are much larger than within firms. So firms which use a lot of software on average they have a they're more energy efficient but changes within a firm are not really economically relevant so um so i said we were also analyzing 
heterogeneous effects. And I want to show you one result here. So we split our sample with respect to the mean energy intensity. So we split it into different quartiles and estimated every, um, yeah, so we estimate our model for every subsample. And you see the results in the left figure, the blue bar are the firms with the lowest energy intensity and the yellow bar are the firms with the highest. And you see that the blue and the red bars are the firms with the lowest energy intensity do not have significant, significant coefficients, so they're close to zero. And then the magnitude increases. So the effect tends to be stronger for firms which have a high energy intensity, which is, I think, an interesting result. So we did the same analysis for the average software intensity. So, yeah, so we excluded software capital stocks, which are zero overall, because it, this would just cause noise. But um, we, we calculated quartiles and we estimate the model for every quartile. And here you see that just the third quartile is significant, but we do not know yet whether there's a meaning behind or whether this is just a random deviation. Um, last but not least, I want to show you one robustness check we conducted. So we were wondering how um, sensitive our results are to the model we apply. So the, there are two other studies on the sectoral level and they use a test production function. So we estimate how we selected our variables based on a test production function, but just estimated a reduced form. So here energy intensity depends on the energy price relative to the producer price index, as well as the ratio of software capital and tangible capital, as well as disembodied technological change. So this is another model, and these are the corresponding results. And so here in the first column, you see when the ratio between software capital to tangible capital changes by 1%, energy intensity decreases by 0.0027%, roughly. So this elasticity is even smaller than with the translog model. But yeah, it leads to the same conclusion that there is a negative relationship, but the relationship is pretty small. Um, you, you observe similar things. If you exclude just zero capital stocks, then the coefficient increases, but gets less significant. And if you only look at active investments, the coefficient increases. So results tend to be robust of the model. And therefore we conclude that an increase in software capital intensity is actually significantly associated with a decrease in energy intensity at the firm level. However, effects are not large enough to substantially improve energy efficiency. Hence the synergies which are assumed by policymakers cannot be confirmed. Moreover, some side results which are interesting that effects appear to be larger for firms with a high energy intensity on average and results indicate a stronger link between than within firms. So thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Gianna. Uh, almost 20 minutes, but we are fine on the, on the time side in this session because we, 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 we have um, only one, one uh, paper left. Uh, so questions from, from the audience, uh, from other participants. Uh, Shivani, it's your time as well, if you want to, to add anything as this is related to what you uh, said, uh, you two told us before, but also other people um, don't see any, any hand or in the chat, let me check. I just think that the results are very interesting. Um, it's a very similar topic. Uh, so yeah, I think um, I think your results are are really interesting and um, yeah, it's a, it would be uh, nice to um, and you do have lots of um, robustness checks which confirm. Uh, so yeah, I, I just think it's very interesting. 
Yeah, yeah, it would be nice to um, just exchange our approaches in a like in a, another conversation. So yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. <laughs> More questions? Uh, any other of the of the members of the public? Yeah. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the critical mass is not, it's not big, right? Um, well, <laughs> let me, I mean, uh, my, my message from the, th actually from the th three first papers is that, um, you know, we may be in, in trouble, right? Because we have um, a very ambitious uh, objectives. Energy efficiency has to play a, a very big role. And, and as you, Jana, showed, uh, you know, it seems that we 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 have taken the the low hanging fruit uh, before, and now I mean we have more and more problems, and and this kind of um, ballot that we thought we had on on, the, on these new technologies, etc. Um, you know, following your 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 paper seems seems to 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 be in trouble as well. I mean that we don't have this this kind of a, um, a silver or, or gold ballot. Um, also, the first paper was was uh, indicating that we may have problems with with rebounds in the industrial sector, etc. So, so what can we do? Actually, um, um, should we focus more on on, on renewables and on, uh, because it seems that, that that you know energy efficiency um, is really important, but we we have problems. Um, 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 uh, stricter policies, what, what do you think? But on the other hand, the stricter policies, we, we have the competitiveness issues, as I mentioned before. I don't know whether the paper says we are in trouble. They, I would just interpret it rather they, that energy efficient or energy savings, the first paper and energy intensity improvements do not go by themselves. So there's some guidance or yeah, some action is needed, I would say, but yeah, so what kind of policy instruments to choose, um, yeah. it's difficult, I would say, but um, yeah, so, um, so yeah, or, or I think my paper or what I intended is that there are a lot of papers from so they're not, yeah, not yeah, from some institutes, but they have, but they say um, that the synergies are super large, but these papers are quite critical because usually there's some, some telecommunication company, which is um, some finding thing, or they're somehow related to a telecommunication company. And it's kind of obvious that there might be something wrong. And I think to have like more detailed results, it's nice to see that that the relationship somehow exists, but it's not that strong and the hopes are not that high, but, um, how, and that it just does not happen by themselves as, as other are stating. So that we need to do something, but I, yeah, but I have to ask that back what the best policy, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Jana. Um, any other comment, question? Uh, Javier, I have a question or comment uh, yeah. uh, to the three of the previous uh, participants. Do you think maybe that the, the impact that ICT technologies could have uh, will be related to also the new role that the distribution system could have in the near future. This means like uh, thinking about demand side response and uh, technologies as vehicle to grid. Uh, uh, and this maybe, if you agree, could be the a way of a jump or uh, of how the ICT could affect or new ICT technologies could affect uh, uh, the energy efficiency if we see the network in a different way. Mm -hmm. Can you formulate your question a bit differently? What you mean yes, if the if the impact of uh, ICT technologies uh, is related to the way we use the distribution grid, uh, I mean the the electric grid, uh, in the sense of 
Ah, uh, okay. You mean uh, you mean flexibility of um, exactly like, so, from yeah, yeah, response. yeah. I I think their ICT have a really large impact. So that's yeah, that's in another sector. So you have like the industry use of the manufacturing sector, for example, which is a lot, and then you have the um, energy sector, which is also I think in Germany third. And their ICTs have a large impact, I would say, on the flexibility, which is super ne necessary for renewables. Yeah, but that yeah, that's another topic or that's uh, or another channel. So. Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Jana, um, for um, a nice presentation as well and clear presentation. So now we go, you know, with plenty of time. I think we'll finish before before time. But probably, if you've been attending other other sessions, this is good news for you. Um, we go to the last uh, presentation by Ivelina. Uh, from Universidad de La Laguna. And uh, I think that there will be now a, a big change from both methodologically and, and also of, of, of subject, right? So, Ivelina, the, time, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, okay, can you see the presentation? Yes, okay. So uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Mr. Chairman, and, and good afternoon uh, to everyone attending uh, this session. Um, my name is uh, Ivelina Mirkova, and I'm a PhD researcher at the University of La Laguna in Tenerife. And uh, today I would like to present you a research that uh, me and my colleagues, Andres Norente and Francisco Ramos, um, conducted on the Canary Islands uh, with the objective to propose uh, a strategy for an integrative and sustainable energy transition in the, uh, especially in the hotel sector. Um, so let me first of all guide you through my presentation. Initially, I'm going to justify the motivation of our research, um, followed by a brief explanation of the methodology and its applications in the existing literature. Um, next, I'm going to explain the research design of our work, the survey, and the choice of participants. And um, point six will shed light on the Q-sorting procedure. And consequently, the, the results will be explained in, in more detail. And to conclude, we're go uh, going to propose measures uh, for a more efficient energy uh, strategy in the Canary Islands and um, some final remarks as well. Um, so as we all know, energy production and consumption are, are the most important uh, sources of uh, CO2 emissions on the planet. Uh, due to the current extreme energy dependence on, on fossil fuels. So in 2012, as you can see on the slide, the European Union uh, heightened its uh, commitments to energy sustainability, uh, stipulating a reduction of at least 40% in, in greenhouse uh, gas emissions by uh, 2030 compared to the 1990 emissions and um, with at least 32% of uh, energy consumed uh, coming from renewable energies. Now, under this framework, uh, Spain has developed the National Integrated Energy and Climate Plan, you know, which in Spanish is called uh, PENIEC, uh, which set the objective for, on a 23% reduction by 2030. On the other hand, the Canary Islands, um, they designed an energy strategy with target emission reduction of uh, 21% by 2025. So it is important to emphasize that due to their favorable climate and location, uh, tourism on the Canary Islands uh, represents 35% uh, of GDP and a bit above 40% of uh, employment. So these numbers suggest that uh, the hotel industry plays uh, a significant role uh, on the islands. And therefore, um, an effective strategy for hotel energy efficiency uh, is needed uh, in order these uh, targets, uh, target reductions to be met. Um, so we asked ourselves the question, how can we obtain a strategy that would actually work and be implemented effectively? So we thought that the design of our, an effective strategy needs to take into account the, the different perspectives of all the stakeholders involved in, in the energy sector. So for this reason, 
uh, we chose the Q methodology, uh, which is um, a mixed method combining both uh, qualitative and quantitative parts, um, and was designed to study people's subjective opinions on a given topic. So first of all, the qualitative part uh, takes place in, in the conducting of the survey and involves um, in-person interviews. Then the, the qualitative aspect uh, occurs uh, when using statistical methods uh, in the analysis and the processing of, of the survey data. Now you, you will probably ask, um, what are the advantages of this method compared to other similar techniques? Well, first of all, this method uh, asks participants to consider simultaneously all variables rather than just uh, focusing and looking into each variable separately, like for instance, in Likert type surveys. Um, this feature helps participants to better prioritize uh, their opinions. And another difference with Likert scale questionnaires is the fact that uh, it can yield significant results using uh, small samples. So similarly, it avoids the problem of uh, low response rate uh, since uh, everyone would agree that face-to-face uh, -face interviews assure a greater response percentage compared to online or, or email-based surveys. And to prove its effectiveness, uh, it is important to mention that Q methodology has also been widely used in, in all sorts of um, areas like uh, psychology, transportation, environmental studies, um, and so on. And it is starting to be implemented more and more in, in, in energy studies. Um, however, uh, to our knowledge, in the current study uh, is the first one, it's the pioneer to implement this uh, particular methodology uh, in the energy efficiency of the hotel sector. Um, now let me explain you our research design. So this methodology consists of uh, several stages. Um, the first stage, uh, in the first stage, we obtained data uh, that allowed us to comprehend the different perceptions uh, that exist on energy transition for hotels in the Canary Islands. And this process consisted of collecting a, a population of, uh, of statements of opinions called a concourse. This population of statements um, was gathered from different sources, from professional literature, in-person interviews, press articles, and other sources of information relevant to, to the topic. And subsequently, after a pilot survey was conducted with five stakeholders, um, a final sample was extracted from the previously selected uh, population of, uh, of statements. Um, the existing literature on Q methodology uh, indicates that the number of statements uh, must be, of course, uh, manageable for both the participant and the, and the researchers. Um, hence, uh, in order not to exhaust the respondents, uh, we chose a, a number that requires an average completion time of between 20 to 40 minutes. And um, for the study, uh, 30 statements were divided into uh, three thematic blocks, and the number of the statements in each block was chosen by, by relevance to the topic and, and further readjusted and confirmed by, by the pilot survey group. Um, so block one contains uh, general measures, uh, taxation and, and awareness. Uh, block two encompasses um, energy saving measures in air conditioning and block three covers uh, energy efficiency. The second uh, stage entails the selection of survey participants uh, who are not chosen at random uh, as in other types of survey. Um, groups of respondents are selected uh, from all sectors related to the topic. So uh, this expert group is called a PSET, and the number of participants can vary between uh, 25 and uh, 40. Um, now, the Q methodology is not intended to extrapolate the results of, uh, of a sample to the entire population, but rather to extract opinions only from the experts. So for this reason, a relatively small amount of uh, 31 individuals were selected from a var variety of experts um, in the energy sector. And as you can see um, on the table, they were subdivided according to their occupational status um, into energy sector, hotel industry, and uh, other uh, groups of interest. Um, once the PSET was built, participants were told uh, to sort the statements by rank ordering their opinions 
uh, in a range of plus four, which is totally agree, to minus four, which is uh, totally disagree. And the Q-sorting procedure follows a quasi-normal force distribution determined by the researcher, um, where a limited number of opinions can be placed in each column, uh, agree, neutral, or, or disagree. So you can see on the slide uh, for more visual, uh, there is a more visual manual example on how respondents uh, uh, distribute their, their responses if it were made um, manually. Uh, for simplicity, in our case, the respondents used a specific software called the uh, Lloyd's QSOL tour to rank order their statements. And after completing the survey, um, participants were asked to share their motives uh, behind their reasoning uh, in an open post survey. Um, the third stage of the research design conducts an inverse statistical factor analysis, uh, where factors represent uh, groups of individuals and not groups of variables. So after the, the Q-sorting procedure was conducted, uh, a principal component analysis uh, was performed uh, with uh, an outcome of eight factors extracted uh, before rotation. Um, in order to facilitate interpretation, um, a very max rotation was performed. Um, let me remind you what I mentioned at the beginning of, um, of my presentation, that um, an inverse uh, factor analysis groups individuals uh, and um, which is our objective in this case and not variables. Uh, so our analysis before rotation showed uh, that all eight factors met the Kaiser criterion of having um, eigenvalues greater than one uh, as shown in the table um, on the slide. Um, however, if we have a look at the screen plot below, um, it flattens uh, at the fourth factor and the explained variance um, is small if uh, more factors are, are added to the analysis. Besides, the retention of four factors is also confirmed by, by the fact that uh, fewer than, than three individuals were entered in factors five to eight. Um, after the very max rotation, uh, six participants uh, were considered indecisive uh, because they loaded significantly on more than one factor and um, they were uh, thus included, uh, excluded uh, from the analysis. Uh, the total cumulative explained variance for el after eliminating the six um, experts uh, was of uh, 54%, uh, which is above 50%, and was considered uh, acceptable. So based on the standardized z-scores of each statement, uh, which were comparable across all factors, a composite or idealized, so to say, uh, Q-sort for each factor was generated uh, as shown on the slide. Um, these four composite Q-sorts represent the generalized uh, mindsets of the individuals who fall into each corresponding factor and have similar uh, points of view. Um, after a deeper analysis of the factors, uh, we transformed them into the following mindsets. So low carbon, techies, skepticals, and trusting. Um, distinguishing statements, uh, the ones marked in green, uh, were identified and analyzed for each factor. Um, these were the statements that yielded the highest uh, z-scores in, in a given factor, which is above 0.5, um, compared to the rest of the factors. Now, I would like to explain you how each mindset was formulated, and for this I'm, I'm going to use uh, as an example the, the low-carbon mindset. Um, the figure on, on the slide shows the uh, distinguishing statements associated with the low carbon mindset uh, marked in green uh, compared with the rest of the factors. So one can observe that uh, this group had the highest scores in response to statements uh, 17, 15, and 24. Um, if you have a look at the table of distinguishing statements for factor one, uh, statements 17 and 15 uh, clearly show that uh, these experts stated their opinions in favor of heat pumps as a short-term solution. According to them, the use of occupancy detectors uh, for lighting savings um, is widespread among uh, the hotels, uh, which is uh, question number 24. And participants in this group uh, gave the lowest ratings to prioritizing R&D projects in the hotel industry, uh, which is question number five. 
furthermore, they valued less the replacement of diesel with natural gas in the hotel industry, which is question number 14. So this group strongly supported applying existing technological energy solutions in the short term and strongly disliked um, all alternatives associated with uh, CO2 emissions. In some, these experts wanted immediate decarbonization without any intermediate steps. So this factor explains 17% of the variance and includes a total of eight experts three of whom uh, work in energy supply companies, two in energy associations, um, two in public administration, and uh, one uh, working hotel maintenance. Um, the remaining three factors were analyzed in the same manner, uh, and the following defining characteristics were reached. So on the one hand, the low carbon group uh, strongly supports uh, applying immediate solutions uh, using the existing energy uh, saving technologies in, in the short term. Additionally, uh, these experts strongly dislike all alternatives uh, associated with CO2 emissions. Um, on the other hand, if we look at the techies group, they demand uh, management systems uh, which use software technologies uh, and have a more future-oriented view. So what is more, they are in the only ones that moderately support green taxes for tourists. The third mindset group, the skeptics, they expressed clear mistrust uh, toward public institutions uh, due to the bureaucratic impediments and, and lack of financial support. Likewise, th those experts are, are very cautious uh, with investments that require long-term recovery for, as for instance, the electric vehicle infrastructure. And the last group, the trusting ones, are characterized by their strong trust in the proactivity of uh, hotel management and the uh, responsible tourist behavior. Besides, another important conclusion drawn uh, from the consensus statements uh, indicates skepticism and uncertainty regarding the post-COVID-19 reality. So just to, to clarify, consensus statements are the ones that uh, all mindset groups uh, agree upon and um, have similar ratings. Um, as a result of the analysis, we proposed uh, various priority objectives which uh, needed to be integrated in the strategy for energy transition in, in the hotel industry on the Canary Islands. So first of all, it became clear uh, that self-consumption using renewable energies together with storage systems is a, is a principal objective. Uh, there is a strong conviction that administrative procedures have to be simplified in order uh, energy efficiency projects to be promoted. And uh, furthermore, heat pumps need to be promoted for, for air conditioning and, and sanitary hot water. Our experts made clear that biomass is not a solution for the Canary Islands uh, strategy due to the high transportation costs and uh, the high level of pollution. And furthermore, regulatory requirements for climate construction of new hotels have to be maintained. Also, it is essential uh, to proper integrate photovoltaic panels uh, in the hotel facility environment. Uh, since we discovered that precisely the experts belonging to the hotel industry are reluctant to, to, to install them. Uh, however, uh, the open-end questions in the, in the post survey showed that uh, they are not against this technology. The problem uh, was the amount of space they occupy and uh, the visual impact. And last but not least, uh, an important objective is to properly train the hotel staff to familiarize them uh, with the use of new energy saving technologies and, and teach them the importance of uh, sustainable behavior. As a conclusion, our research demonstrates that Q methodologies are a very useful too when designing an integrative uh, strategy for energy transition. Um, this work focuses on the hotel industry However, the methodology is perfectly adequate for designing any type of strategy where stakeholders' opinions are a key factor for its effectiveness and, and implementation. Um, to our knowledge, this study is pioneering in applying the Q methodology to the uh, effective use of energy in the hotel sector. And furthermore, results show that the post-COVID-19 era uh, still represent an unsolved puzzle for the energy stakeholders, especially when dealing with uh, tourism and, and hotel industry. So to wrap up, the results obtained from our research can serve as a first uh, glimpse of an energy transition problem 
that can be extrapolated to a future more global study on the decarbonization of the Canary Islands. Now, I would like to thank you uh, for your attention and I'm looking forward to the Q&A session. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ivalina. A very clear presentation and, and you stick to the, to the time. So let's see if we have um, any, any questions from the remaining participants uh, in the session. Um, not seeing any any hand or in the chat. Let me check. No, no questions. So um, this is a very, very interesting topic, right? And and, and very relevant. Um, I, I could like to know your because perhaps I, I didn't. Um, you know, I, I don't know about this methodology or, or even the, 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 the hotel industry a lot, but um, you only choose um, experts, right? Um, could you uh, apply this methodology um, to, to get information from, let's say, customers, for instance, or workers in the, in the, in the industry? Because I guess that, you know, I don't know whether they can provide also some possible solutions to the to the problem. Apologies if this, what I'm saying is is nonsense, but but uh, I, no, 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 I, no, I, no. I I I wonder whether you know you can extend a bit because sometimes you know these experts are are fine, but we know that we are. I mean. Uh, um, sometimes selecting, uh, you know, people with uh, narrow views or, or with interests on their own, etc. Right? Yes. So yeah, very interesting question. Um, it can be used, of course, with uh, other groups of interest uh, that are related to any other topic. Um, the, the the one thing that uh, it's not limiting, but uh, as I mentioned in my in my presentation, uh, it uh, works with small uh, small samples. So, for instance, if you would like to make a huge survey with uh, thousand participants, uh, well, it would be kind of um, not applicable because um, um, it would be there will be many uh, Q. Uh, uh, Q sets and um, it wouldn't be applicable. But uh, for instance, if you have a, a firm and you uh, with uh, I don't know maybe hundred uh, employees and you would like to know the opinion of uh, of each department on how uh, energy efficiency, for instance, uh, is working or what are the any other uh, uh, labor condition or whatsoever, uh, it can be done. And um, in my research, I chose experts, but from from different uh, from different areas. So I chose uh, academics uh, from the university. I chose hotel managers, hotel technicians, also um, some uh, energy companies, uh, uh, politicians, uh, energy associations. So I, I try to extract from um, each uh, sector that. Uh, deals with uh, with this issue uh, the, the the let's say the best representative they're never the best but uh, uh, we we are a small community here on the canary Islands, so we we try to to select uh, the best sample but it could be it could be done uh, just bear in mind that uh, it has to be small there is a question in the chat um about experts distribution among different mindsets is there any pattern someone asks andres asks yeah yeah actually there is um i i i have uh, it's really interesting this question because i was uh, following the the um, panel sessions of yesterday and actually all the the findings that these experts uh, it's not, not findings but their their point of view because they were from different uh, areas, uh, actually matched these four um, mindsets that uh, that were selected. And I have some 
backup. I have a backup slide somewhere. I had some. Let me show you. Um, yeah, here, for instance. So uh, as I told you, we have uh, uh, the, these experts uh, from all different areas. And um, all the energy stakeholders <clears throat> agree that uh, energy transition is important and has to be done. But um, how and when are quite different, uh, depending on, on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on the effect uh, of the different energy stakeholders. So I'll give you a very quick comparison from yesterday's plenary session. So Patrick uh, Bouillon, uh, I, I hope that I pronounced the name well, uh, he's the CEO of Total Energy. So basically he said that uh, his company needs to, to make money today from carbon and coal in order to be able to change uh, the company's uh, business model. But, but Ivelina, here, maybe you can see that uh, mainly low carbon are people the, of the energy sector. Tech is this other group of interest. And, yeah. uh, there is certain patterns, people that is uh, uh, in, the, in the activity, in the, in the current activity of the hotel is in the low carbon and people that is more academic and more technicians, not in the in the day and day day to day, is here in the techies and the skeptics are hotel industry and uh, and, uh, and politicals maybe, but there is no a clear clear uh, but there are certain uh, tendencies. There, uh, yeah, of course there are tendencies. Uh, so as you can see, five out of the eight. Uh, total respondents in the low carbon group belong to the energy sector. So this is like um, a bit more than 60% of the total respondents in that uh, group. And uh, this is in line with uh, their vision of uh, using existing technology immediately and not wait for intermediate steps. And also another observation um, is that around 66% of techies belong to uh, other groups of interest. And all the representatives of the NGOs and university academics belong to the, to the techies. Um, also, it is uh, curious to mention that um, all the hotel associations are in the, in the trusting mindset. So this reaffirms their belief in the sector. Um, but what I wanted to also to point out is that uh, um, CEOs and entrepreneurs and uh, people, uh, businessmen who, who are decision makers and have to make money decisions, uh, their point of view uh, is that huge investments need to be measured carefully and cannot be done immediately. And this is also our skeptical point of view, which uh, um, is a factor three and the participants are actually hotel managers uh, and uh, the rest belong to private energy firms. So this is, uh, in line with uh, what, what has been said uh, so far. Um, yeah, I think uh, um, if, uh, if I can clarify anything else for you, um, if maybe I, I couldn't explain well the, the, the graph, please um, ask. Um, any other question? I don't see anybody. Um, um, Evelina, and you, you uh, uh, of course, I mean, we, we know that Canary Islands is, is, is uh, one of the top destinations uh, in the world uh, in tourist terms and, and the tourist uh, sector is, is very important there. And of course, it has um, different uh, characteristics uh, which demand um, specific analysis and you, you do that and you discover Mm, you know some some specifics uh, also um, um, regarding the you know the, the, the conclusions of your of your paper. Um, but uh, do you think that this paper can be extrapolated um, to to other um, tourism uh, industries uh, across the world? I mean, what's what's your view on this? Yes, yes, of course. Why not? I mean, what. What I was planning for my future work is to uh, extrapolate it to, to a higher level, a more global view of, of uh, energy transition and not, not focus only on the, on the hotel industry. 
but of course it can be applied to any other location uh, to see what the, the views of stakeholders in this particular area are. Uh, because I think it's um, for policymakers who mm, usually do not work or, or some of them have worked in, in, the, in the hotel sector, but for them it's easy in, in a way to, to make uh, decisions for um, policies. Uh, however, uh, if you ask the, the people who actually work uh, in, in this uh, industry, then the realities are different. So I think there must be some synergies between all the stakeholders in, all, in order for each strategy to, to be successful and to, to be um, implemented uh, in an effective way. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think it was a very interesting um, session. Um, I learned um, a lot. I think the presentations were very nice in general. Um, and, uh, and we stick to the time. So if there is nothing else, um, Diego, I think uh, we can stop here. Thank everybody, both the participants and uh, and the audience and um, and say goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.